Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here um, to share with you an approach to landscape, uh, landscaping and landscape design that I'm very passionate about um, and very enthusiastic about, and that is xeriscaping. Xeriscaping is something that I practice not only in my work when I provide designs, but it's something that I do personally. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, a little bit about me, uh, not to uh, be too redundant with what Lori says, but I am a landscape designer. I've been providing landscape designs in our area since 2003. Um, I do uh, mainly residential and community and some commercial. I love working with homeowners on renovating their existing landscaping. Uh, to a xeriscape approach and also with new construction. New construction you have just basically a blank palette. Um, uh, next one. A little bit more about myself. I also love to be involved in our community. I, I do a lot of volunteer work. Um, some of the projects that I've done is I uh, did the landscape design and, and donated labor uh, to build the Garden of Hope for the, Larimer, the Food Bank for Larimer County. I also did the landscape design and donated my labor, these working hands here, for the Youth Foundation Safe House. Um, this year, I'm doing a landscape design for the Care House. We're building them a community garden for their families. Um, I also give presentations and workshops at colleges, garden clubs, and community programs. I also have worked with Lori Diodney on some of their water conservation programs. My hobbies, gardening, really. Do you think I really like gardening as a hobby? Actually, I really do. I love gardening, and um, I would have to say that my yard itself is not the most um, attractive to what people would think a landscape designer should have, but that is because I'm constantly uh, experimenting with new plants, plants um, you know, promoted by Plant Select, and a lot of times in my landscape designs, I will not recommend plants to homeowners if I haven't planted them myself. I want to know how they work and what they like. Um, in the off season, uh, when, I'm, when it's a little bit slower with the landscape design, I have a greenhouse. And this is actually a photo right here of my greenhouse. Um, and it's, uh, it's greening up right now as we speak. Um, um, I love to grow vegetables from seed and perennials and annuals. I share them with my friends and family. And then I donate the plants to the community gardens and also the food products that, that they produce. Um, this evening, what I like to do is talk a little bit more about Xeriscape. How many of you are familiar with the concept of Xeriscape? Just by a show of hands. Very good, very good. I'm just going to do a quick review for those of you that are new to the, uh, the approach of landscaping and go through the definition. Uh, Xeriscape landscaping, by, de by definition, is landscaping designed specifically for areas that are dry or susceptible to a drought. And guess what? Where we live, we're susceptible to drought. Um, it is also where properties practice water conservation. Xeriscape, uh, the word was derived from the Greek word xeros, meaning dry, and then obviously have scape. So basically it means dryscape. For a quick review, I'd like to go through the seven principles of Xeriscape. And starting with the first principle of planning and design. Whether you're uh, having a new home built and you have nothing in your yard yet, or whether you're renovating an existing landscaping, you want to take the time and plan and design. Um, it's so easy to get caught up and just want to go out in the yard and just start ripping out turf and moving things and chopping things down. But you do want to start with the smart approach of having a plan and having a design. Um, in a renovation, for example, you may want to eventually facelift the whole backyard, but you might want to start in sections because landscaping, if you're doing the work itself, I always say it's going to take three times longer than what you think. Always does. It always looks like this is going to be a simple little project, and then three months later, we're still hammering away. Um, so you want to start with a plan, and you want to figure out how you're going to use your landscape functionally and what you want aesthetically. Um, and by planning, you'll, be, you'll ensure yourself for implementing those features for water conservation. 
The second principle of, of zero scape is soil improvement, or what we call soil amendment, and that is when we add organic matter to the soil. Um, plants are a lot healthier and grow better and use less water if they have the pr proper soil environment. So again, we usually t use compost and manure. In our region, there's two types of soil. There's clay and there's sand. Both are just awful, just terrible. So what amending the soil does is for our clay soils, which basically get bogged down, composting and manure open up airspace and allow oxygen to move around in the soil, which is healthy for the roots. And for our sandy soils, it helps retain the water that the plant needs. Now we do have native plants, and some of those native plants don't like soil amendment. Some native plants are adapted to our soils, whether they be clay or sand, and we don't really have to amend the soil when we plant them, but we do need uh, to kind of loosen up the soil around them to get the roots of the plant to start growing, and I call the roots the feet, get their feet established. Um, typically with soil amendment, we take one to three inches of compost and we till that in to a depth of about six to eight inches. The third concept of zero scape is efficient <coughs> irrigation. Um, and that means probably ir properly irrigating those areas of your, your yard. For example, you want to water your turf areas separately then from your garden beds. Some people think that garden beds with trees and shrubs and perennials and ground cover actually take more water than turf. And that is not true. Our turf takes a lot more water than our garden beds. So in our garden beds, we typically use drip irrigation systems, uh, bubblers, um, emitters for watering our trees, our shrubs, and our ground covers. Um, another um, principle that goes hand in hand with that is selecting appropriate plants. You want to select appropriate plants. Now there are xeric plants, there are native plants, um, but what you want to do is you want to group these plants together in your landscape and that you want to group plants that have similar light requirements and also similar water needs. So if you have some plants that like just maybe some supplemental water, you don't want to mix those in a bed with some plants that require a little bit more water each week or every couple of weeks, you won't be conserving water that way. So we're going to be grouping our plants together with similar water requirements. And in all of these concepts that I'm sharing with you, we're going to be breaking those down just a little bit deeper in my discussion. Mulches, we have basically mulches uh, that are organic and uh, inorganic. Organic mulches are things like wood chips, shredded cedar, um, cut, uh, cuttings, things like that. Um, and they have a tendency to break down into the soil and then add nutrients back into the soil. Non-organic mulch would be something like rock. Rock and gravel would be a type of inorganic mulch. The other principle, or the sixth principle of uh, xeriscape is turf alternatives. Um, and when xeriscape, it's not true that you can't have a lawn for your kids to play on or your dogs to roam. Basically, in practicing the xeriscape principles, you are reducing turf areas to where they are appropriate. There are some impractical places for turf, like on slopes that are in the dry, hot sun all day, which you can't water efficiently. Um, some other turf alternatives are to use uh, native and low water use plants in your garden bed. So there might be a turf area right now that is just always, the, the grass is always brown, it's always hot, you're just feeding it and feeding it water. Um, and so it might be more appropriate to take that piece of turf and convert it into maybe a garden bed and add some low water plants and have something nice visually to look at. There are turf alternatives for your lawn, such as buffalo grass, blue grandma, turf type, tall fescues, and fine fescues. And we'll talk about those a little bit more later. Maintenance. Maintenance. There will be maintenance to your xeriscape, your dryscape. There will be maintenance. Um, xeriscape, just like your traditional gardens, need to be watered, pruned, fertilized, and controlled. But what you will find with Xeriscape is over time, 
that maintenance will decrease as the plants mature, as your watering zones are now um, irrigating at the proper amount for the mature plants. So over time, you'll decrease in maintenance, but not right out of the box. So what I'd like to share with you is a few things that I hear all the time from homeowners and landscape uh, as a landscape designer. And these comments come from people that live in Colorado and also those that, that have recently moved here from back east. Some people just don't want to do any more research or know anything more about xeric plants because they think they don't afford them things that they want. For example, some of the comments that I hear. I want a lot of color. I like a lot of color. I like a lot of plants. I like to cut flowers. Xeric plants don't provide that. Or I want my garden to look good in the winter time. And when I think of xeric, I think of a desert. And as I look out into the desert, there's nothing there. Everything's kind of dead in the winter. Um, I like aromatic plants. So xeric, there, possibly there can't be any xeric plants that can be, that can smell good. Um, I want to attract birds and bees and butterflies. So I want to attract a wildlife. Xeric plants probably only attract what snakes and frogs and things like that. Um, I have some specific functional reasons for why I want a xeriscape. I, I want some hedging and some screening from my neighbors. I want to have some privacy or I'm trying to screen out maybe some vistas that aren't so attractive around my landscape. And also I like to plant annuals. And annuals definitely cannot be xeric. There's just no way. Hmm. Some uh, more reasons is I can't xeriscape my yard because I need lawn for children to play. And you can't just have you can't have a lawn when you use the xeriscape principles of design. Or I have to use rock, and I hate rock. Or my yard is already landscaped, so therefore I, there's no way I can retrofit it into xeriscape. It's already there. We also have the other flip side of why we want it, <laughs> zero escape. <clears throat> I don't have to water. I don't have to amend the soil or fertilize. I don't have to prune because my, my plants are going to take care of themselves. And because they're xeric and native, they're not going to die. They're going to be there forever. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. A few more false expectations. It's only going to take a one year and I plant it and it's all going to be all grown up. It's going to be beautiful. And I can go on vacation because the yard's going to take care of itself. Or I only have to water my lawn once a year. Or I bought all my plants at a local nursery, so they all must be xeric. Hmm, so these are some false expectations that we have. So what I'd like to do is share with you, in addition to understanding the principles of xeriscaping, I'd like to bust these myths right out of the water. These are not true things, and I'm going to share with you why. Some of them you know, may already be common sense, um, but let's stop the madness. First of all, I like to talk about plants and jump right into plants because a lot of us, when we think of our landscaping, especially on a day like this where it's beautiful out, it's spring, we can't wait to get in the yard, we are dying for color. We want color out there. We are tired of looking at the brassy um, grass and things like that. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about xeric plants. There's xeric plants and there's native plants. And xeric plants are basically those plants that have been labeled xeric that require a lot less water than other plants that we have available to us. Um, again, when uh, using xeriscape principles, you don't have to use just xeric plants. That's not the case at all. You can use plants available from our local nurseries, and some of those plants may have way more water requirements than a xeric plant. And they have to be available, and those plants at our local nurseries have adapted, or they're, they're winners in our environment. For example, you might have a, a slope, and your neighbor has grass all the way up here and he is just watering the heck out of it because it's always brown and dry and all that water is jumping down right into your garden bed. Do you want to put xeric plants there? No, no. So we need plants tolerant of more water. When we talk about grouping plants, a one, um, one word that you should get used to or, or should know the meaning of is hydrozoning. Hydrozoning, hydro, water, and zoning. Again, this falls into grouping plants with the similar water needs. Um, you might, and I've seen d various uh, labels for this. For example, I've seen where people have high levels of water needs, which would be areas like your turf, 
medium, which could be some trees and shrubbery, and some low, which could be more of your xeric plants. Um, so there also might be non-irrigated areas in your landscape. Let's say you have some large acreage and you're only landscaping you know, around the house. When you're doing your planning and design, what you should do is you should sit down and think about those areas and look at your, your landscape that are going to be of different water needs. So for example, that slope where I said all the neighbor's water is coming down, well that's going to be a little bit more wet. Your turf areas are going to be wet. And you might have some garden beds, and one garden might be of plants that require more water than this other garden that may be a combination of xeric plants and others. Um, one thing that I do see, how many in here have a drip irrigation system in their garden beds? Oh, quite a few of you. One thing I do see often um, is we go to the nursery and we, we're, we want to conserve water and we get really excited because they got beautiful plants there. And we're inspecting them and we say, oh wow, this, this plant's really great but it takes a lot more water than what I have at home. And I really like this plant, but it doesn't take as much water. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these plants with different water requirements. I'm going to put them in the same bed on the same drip zone. And then I'm going to take the drippers or emitters and I'm going to get different ones. Ones that water like two gallons per hour and one gallon per hour and half gallon per hour and solved. No, that is not water conservation by any means because where you have your two gallon per hour emitter, that is going, the water around that is definitely going to leach out and kill your dry xeric plant. So, and it's a mess too. What a mess. Let's not do that. Um, xeric plants, not only are, do we look at them for their aesthetic value, but for their functional value. You know, when we think of our landscape, the very first thing I do when I sit down with a homeowner in design is think about the functional aspects of how they want to use the outdoor space. The plants to me sometimes are kind of icing on the cake, you know, the pretty stuff. But it is the way that we use our landscape. If we don't have it set up where functionally we enjoy it, we're not going to go out there, you know. So functionally, the landscape has to work for us and provide those things that we want and so we can entertain and play at like we want to. Um, xeric plants, by definition, are, again, are those that use very little water. They can be indigenous or native. Some of them have been introduced to us from other areas of the country, even overseas. And basically, they have adapted to our high desert environment and our soils. Um, the other advantage of using xeric plants and, and native plants is that a lot of times because they have adapted and they are used to our icky, icky soils, they require less nutrients. So let's talk first about color in the landscape and how can xeric plants provide color in the landscape. Now I'm not going to go through the whole list of xeric plants and show you all of those. I'll save that for the next workshop. But I do want to talk about color in the landscape using xeric uh, plants. And I'm going to start off with perennials. Perennials are plants that uh, come back every season and die back to the ground in the winter time. When you think about color in your landscape, the first thing that I will ask a homeowner is, what kind of flavor of color do you enjoy? Um, you will find that some people ha are more attracted to the blues, the pinks, the whites, the pastels. Some others are more bold colors, oranges and reds and things like that. In this uh, slide right here, I'm showing uh, plants in the, um, li the lighter colors, and we have a beautiful ground cover called Christopher, uh, Crystal River or Veronica. Long bloom time, it's a beautiful ground cover, has a very nice blue, light blue color to it. Um, a perennial that I'm showing here, uh, Coral Canyon Twin Spur, um, and I'm going to say is my favorite, and I'm going to say that on every single plant, and you're going to get so tired of hearing that. Um, Coral Canyon is a beautiful pink. Uh, coral deep rose uh, color and long blooming and it is so easy to take care of it you don't even have to talk to it it doesn't even like to be talked to it might even talk back if you try to talk to it it's lovely it's a lovely plant and even a daisy like 
plant, such as lavender mist sun daisy. What a beautiful xeric plant to have in your garden. In the bold colors, there are some xeric plants, such as um, ice plant. Many of you might be familiar with ice plant. I think ice plant is a wonderful ground cover, and I enjoy it because it ha does typically have a long bloom time, and also the foliage of it is semi-evergreen. So it tries to stay green in the winter time. If you like the bold oranges, you know, the Rocket City daylilies. Daylilies are typically uh, xeric, and there's a nice, the Rocket City daylily is just really bold with its orange color. A new fad of plant that I think almost everybody has now or is adding to their, their garden is chocolate flower. And why? Because it smells like chocolate, yeah. It smells like chocolate. It's a beautiful daisy-like looking flower and it's very xeric. And also we have the deep blues of our beer tongue or our pestamen. So these are some more bolder colors. So you can see how xeric plants, and this is just a very, it's a handful. There's a list, long list of, of uh, perennials and various colors and various bloom times, but just to show the point that you can have beautiful color in your landscape with xeric plants. In addition, we also have some beautiful xeric deciduous shrubs. For example, here we have the butterfly bush, and it's a very attractive bush. Uh, weeping, it can be used as a specimen bush, and it is very xeric. Um, the Spanish gold broom. Um, has a beautiful yellow flower. It kind of reminds me of a forsythia, but forsythias aren't xeric, where the Spanish gold broom is xeric. And the Spanish gold broom also has its stems, when the, the um, blooms are done, the stems of the Spanish gold broom remain green, and they just provide such great visual interest. So again, they, that is semi-evergreen for winter time. And then, of course, you got the potentias. And everybody knows about the potentias. And no, you don't have to use the yellow potentias. Potentias can be very, very beautiful. I find that a problem with potentias in our area is that they're not proper, properly pruned. So they get really uh, stickly and thick and they don't look attractive anymore. But there are a variety of colors in potentia and potentia being a very xeric plant. This one, the Red Ace, is a very pretty reddish-orange color. And how about winter interest? You know, what is our yard going to look like in the winter? You know, we all get excited in the summer and the spring because we want color, but really, we only have like a six-month growing season. So basically, six months out of the year, we turn off our irrigation systems in October, and we don't turn them back on until May. So we have a very short growing season. So just as important as having all that color and beauty in the spring and summer is how will your yard look in winter time? When you drive home from work from, from a long, hard day, are you looking at a bunch of dead sticks? You know, is there any interest out there? Is there any beauty? When you're sitting at your kitchen table and the snow is falling, do you see some gorgeous, gorgeous things happening out there? Um, so in Zurich, our Zurich evergreen trees are fabulous. We have our ponderosa pine. And in the picture up here, I'm showing the ponderosa pine used in a Japanese garden. This Japanese garden is not in Japan. This Japanese, gar Japanese garden is in Colorado. And just a special prayer right now for ja Japan. Um, but you, in Zurich, you don't, Zurich is um, the concept of using uh, dry landscaping, but it's not a style of landscaping. With our plants, you can have an English garden, a cottage garden, a Japanese garden, a formal garden, an informal garden. It just depends on how you place the plants and how, how you would like them to look. Winter interest is really important in Colorado because it is pretty brown out here. You know, we are high desert. And so another one of the evergreen uh, trees that I really like is the bristlecone pine. The bristlecone pine is one of the oldest trees living trees. Um, the last I heard, the last one I heard, the oldest living bristle cone last found was 1,500 years old and still living. And a very, very, very beautiful pine. Um, we also have our pinion pine. Pinion pines are very xeric. Uh, they can pop up anywhere and they also produce the beautiful pinion, uh, pinion 
nut. Uh, when I was growing up, my grandfather had loads and loads of pinion pines, and he'd go and, and load up, get all, gather all the seeds for me, and then he'd roast them and send them to me in big bags, and they still bring back such a fantastic memory. And then we have our junipers. Now I know juniper. When you say that word, a lot of people just go, ah, junipers, you know? We think of the big crawling junipers that have enveloped our property because that was the style back in the 70s. I mean, planted junipers everywhere, and, and now all we have is, is like brown looking things with voles and Coke cans and, and um, paper and trash. And, and so I know it can be a bad word, but there are some beautiful junipers and junipers do serve a purpose. You know, if you've got <clears throat> a real big slope here that it's not practical to have turf, and it's not practical to have any type of plant material that requires a lot of water because that water is just gonna run off. Uh, then our creeping junipers are a good suit because they will grow and they will hold the soil and prevent erosion. So, yeah, they don't always have to have such a bad wrap. Um, we also have some upright junipers that are very attractive. We have the Rocky Mountain juniper, which has kind of like a blue tint to it. Not everything in the landscape has to be green. You know, mix it up a bit. And then we also have our one seed juniper, which is more of a shrubby looking juniper. We also have evergreen shrubs and broadleaf evergreen shrubs. Broadleaf evergreen shrubs are those that have leaves on them, not, ne not needles, and they don't drop those leaves in the wintertime. Um, here I'm going to show you some, some xeriscape and evergreen shrubs. Um, desert holly is beautiful. Now that is a holly that loves the sun and loves it to be hot, can grow it in the desert. So it's not a shade holly. Um, some of you might be familiar with our Oregon grape holly, and, but those types of hollies that have the beautiful blueberry and you think of them at Christmas time, do require shade. They will not tolerate our, our dry afternoon heat. Um, but the, the desert holly is a beautiful holly and can be grown in the sun. Here you also see its beautiful yellow bloom that it produces. Um, some other broadleaf evergreens are Panchito manzanita. Um, this is a great ground cover. It produces a little pink flower in the spring and it is broadleaf evergreen. So again, it doesn't lose its leaves in the winter time. And below that we see kinnikinnick or bearberry. That particular ground cover is also evergreen, but it likes to be in the shade, whereas the manzanita can tolerate the sun. Kinnikinnick and bearberry is also one of the very few plants that we can use under pine trees. Um, Spanish goldroom, and you will see me bring up some of the plants uh, a couple of times to show their, their versatility in the landscape. Spanish goldroom again, another type of evergreen because of the green stems that it has. And then we have our mugo pines. And mugo pines come in, there's a variety of mugo pines. Some are very, very small. Our little mops mugo, he only gets to be about two feet, three feet tall and wide. And then we have the larger mugos that can get to be like 15, 20 feet tall by 15 to 20 feet wide. Mugo pines add wonderful winter interest, especially in garden beds where, which are very small, where you don't have you know, expansive areas to put in these larger evergreens. Um, how many of you have a dry stream bed in your landscape, a cobble bed? A few of you. Um, dry stream beds is pretty much a, a design trend, a little bit overused, but um, it is funny. When uh, I'm working with a new homeowner, and you go to a, a new home that has absolutely no construction, and then you see all of the downspouts, and the downspouts are hitting that bare soil, and well, then what happens is that soil just kind of trenches right there because there's nothing to hold it back. So right away they think, oh my gosh, I, I'm gonna have a river here. Oh my gosh. And that's not the case necessarily. Um, it's just because there's no turf or anything there to prevent that. But in some cases, there might be a dry stream bed uh, for a functional reason that is catching some extra uh, runoff and drain off. And with those dry stream beds, 
what I see is the cobble, but nothing else. And then we have turf on each side or, or what have you. It's really, really nice when you dress those dry stream beds up. And if you can visualize what that would look like up in the mountains, that's how it should look like in your yard. And using the smaller mugle pines with a couple of large boulders on your dry stream just brings that to life. Also using some uh, xeric, uh, perennials around there bring that dry stream to life. Don't leave it just to be just cobble. Ornamental grasses. Love ornamental grasses. We've used them for their sound and their movement. There are so many out there. Some people say, oh, I don't like those ornamental grasses. And I'm like, well, why is that? Well, I see that one everywhere at Sentara, and it's tall, and it's brassy, and, and I really don't like it. I really don't like it. And then I hear others say, well, that grass is used everywhere. So, you know, it's overused, don't like it. There are so many more varieties of ornamental grasses. Um, there are very small grasses, such as our little blue fescue here that only gets to be about six to eight inches. This looks really good in a dry stream bed, too. You know, popping it over in your cobble. Give it some more life. We have our larger blue av avena grass, which is a beautiful, beautiful blue leaf uh, ornamental grass. Gets a little bit larger, about three, three feet by three feet. And then we have what we call the bunny grass, fountain grass. Some people call those little bunny tails. They get about three feet. But they, their seed heads are very interesting, very light, very airy, kind of remind people of tails. Okay. And then we have our gracilimus, or our larger grasses. And there are larger grasses in the Miscanthus family. This is one of my favorites. There I go using that word again. Um, this one, the seed has have a purplish tint to them. And it's a beautiful ornamental grass. Does get fairly tall. You have to expect that these grasses usually get four to six feet tall and could be the same in width. One grass that I'm using quite a bit until it's overused and we're sick of looking at it, is the Korean feather reed grass, which is in the same family as that Korean feather reed grass, the big, tall, brassy one. The Korean feather reed grass um, does stay about, you know, very, the width isn't very, very much, but it has more of a blue, or a, excuse me, a purple, pinkish tint to the seed head. So if you're tired of looking at Carl Forrester, but you really like that grass, you might want to consider the Korean feather reed grass. Um, just as a side note, the taller the grass is, the more water it's going to take. Okay, so your littler grasses don't use as much water. And then how about xeric plants for aroma? You know, having some good smells. Well, one of the plants, a very, very xeric plant, is woolly thyme. Woolly thyme is typically used in rock gardens or as a ground cover. We also use it between our flagstones or our, our path material. Um, woolly thyme, this is not the culinary type. This is not the type that you eat. This is the kind you want to step on because when you step on it, it releases a beautiful smell. Um, another uh, aromatic plant is the double mint uh, wild hyssop, and I have to I have to fix this slide here. I see that our, well, we're, get, we're okay. We're not getting cut off. Uh, double bit wild hyssop. Um, this plant is one of my favorites. Oh my gosh! Now this plant actually attracts hummingbirds. It has a tubular flower, and it's in bloom when our hum the hummingbirds come to visit us here in Fort Collins and Windsor, um, and it has a, the smell of aniseed. We have another very xeric, very, very xeric plant called lavender cotton. Lavender cotton has a beautiful yellow flower on it. Um, now, when we talk about aromatic plants, things like lavender cotton, it has kind of a musty smell. Some people think it also smells a little garlicky. garlicky. So what might smell good to you might not smell good to this person over here. So go ahead, get out there, touch step on them and smell the plants and figure out which smells you like to incorporate into your gardens. Attracting wildlife. I always hear this, attracting wildlife. What kind of wildlife? Mountain lions? What, what, what are we talking about here? Um, attracting wildlife. Typically what we're trying to do is bring in the birds, the hummingbirds and the butterflies. And we have beautiful xeric plants that do so. One of our deciduous trees, and deciduous meaning uh, a plant that will lose its leaves 
in the winter time is our Russian hawthorn. The Russian hawthorn um, has a beautiful white spring blossom and then in the late summer and fall produces a beautiful red berry. Um, butterflies are very much attractive to this ornamental tree. This tree doesn't get very large. We call it ornamental. It gets to be about 20 to 30 feet tall by about 15 to 20 feet wide. Um, and it is a very ornamental tree. Going to bring back up that silver fountain butterfly bush. Hint, it's got butterfly in the title. It must attract butterflies, and it does. Also, down here we have an, a perennial, red birds in a tree. How many have this plant in their garden, red birds in a tree? Isn't it a beautiful perennial? Um, the blooms of a red birds in a tree actually look like little red birds in a tree. And again, having that tubular flower attracts the hummingbirds. So again, remember tubular flowers, and then all, it also has the scarlet red color. That scarlet red is really attractive to, to hummingbirds also. And bringing back up the double mint uh, hyssop, because of the two bureau flower. Now, when you're looking for plants and you go, okay, so hummingbirds like tubular flowers. Okay, and you go to your nursery and you, you load up your cart with all the plants that have tubular flowers. Before you do that, make sure that flower is in bloom when the hummingbirds are supposed to get here. Okay? Real important point. What about repelling wildlife? Well, we, we work so much tracked it and then we try to get rid of it and I'm, I'm speaking of deer, bunny rabbits, chipmunks, all those things we don't want in our landscape. Now we have plants and they're labeled as deer resistant, wildlife resistant, but I'm going to tell you if that deer is hungry, that deer is going to eat your plant. Okay, and so will the bunny. So there are no guarantees. So don't be misinformed or get the false expectation that they're going to not eat your plants. If they're hungry, they're going to eat the darn plant. They do have a tendency to stay away from plants that have like a milky sap, you know, like some succulents um, or anything that's prickly, spiny, leathery, tough, or toxic. Um, so those types of plants um, discourage wildlife. Uh, the Russian hawthorn, huh, didn't I just say it attracts wildlife? Now I'm going to say it repels wildlife. It does. It, uh, it repels deer. It has thorns on it. So you use the Russian hawthorn to attract the butterflies, and then you use it also to deter the deer. Hmm. Wow. What a great plant. Okay. Um, other plants with very thick leaves, like the kinnikinnik, the burberry, not attracted to that, and the, the sun daisy. Um, it has a fuzzy foliage and aroma that the wildlife just a, doesn't like. So we do have xeric plants that attract wildlife and repel wildlife, and as with the Russian hawthorn, you get two birds or butterflies with one tree. What about xeriscaping in the shade? A lot of people think, how can you xeriscape in the shade? When we think xeriscape, we think dry, hot, sunny. That's not necessarily true in our, in our zero escape approach because we have what we call dry shade, right? We have shade, but it's not wet there, not like back east. Just because it's shady doesn't mean that it's moist. And when you have areas under pine trees that you've kind of limbed up, that's dry shade. Uh, xeric plants that require sun are not going to work in your shade garden. So we have plants specifically for the microclimate of dry shade. Um, some of the turf grasses, such as fine fescues, do really well uh, in shade, are tolerant of the shade. And if you are receding your, your turf area with more uh, drought tolerant species, a lot of times we use what we call a shady, uh, shady blend, grass seed mix that has a combination of grasses. And usually fine fescues is one of the components um, of those mixes. The kinnikinnik and bearberry, again, underneath that pine tree, where it's all, you know, I have a pine tree and I can't grow anything under it. I don't want to get rid of it, so you can limit up a little bit and put in a beautiful dry shade garden. Kinnikinnik will thrive in that environment. We also have plants in the euonymus family, such as the winter creeper. And the winter creeper turns a beautiful uh, wine red purple color in the winter time. Um, and it won't lose its leaves in the winter time, but it does have to be in the shade. These plants will not tolerate the dry, the dry west exposure or sun. 
um, of, our, of our days. Um, then we bring in the creeping Oregon grape, um, which is the beautiful um, creeping holly, and it has the beautiful berries, and we think of Christmas time with the Mahonias, and, and they're prickly, and they're gorgeous, and they do well in our dry shade, but don't put them out in the sun. Um, one of my favorite shade perennials are corabels. Who likes corabels? Anybody in here like corabels? Oh man, a fan of corabels. Corabels are one of the easiest perennials to grow. They are xeric. Many of them are very xeric. Um, we like corabels because of their blooms, but in addition, corabels have beautiful foliage. Oh my gosh, they come in chartreuse and, and oranges and reds and purples and, and there's nothing more I like to see than a whole variety of corabels just planted in mass. Unbelievable. And again, a very easy plant to grow and take care of. Hedges and screening. How can we use their plants for hedges and screening? Well, privet. Privet has been around for a long time and is known to be a good uh, hedge plant. Our Cheyenne privet is a very xeric plant. It gets to be about 10 feet tall, about six feet wide. It is deciduous, so it is gonna lose its leaves in the winter time. You can also create a hedge using our upright junipers. The Wichita blue juniper has a very beautiful blue tint to it. It gets to be about 10 to 15 feet tall, spreads about four to six feet wide, and it's evergreen. Now, whether you're retrofitting a yard or it, you're into a new, new landscape, when you think about privacy and screening, which most of us do at some point, when you're thinking about your hedging and what plants you want to use for that function, you want to consider how long you want your privacy. Do you want it all year round? 365 days, I don't want to look at that, whatever it is over there. Or is it just that you don't want to look at what's over there or them to look at what's over here in the summertime? So that's going to make a decision for you as whether you're going to use a deciduous plant versus an evergreen plant. If you want that privacy all the time, use something that's more evergreen. And annuals, do we have xeric annuals? Yes, we have xeric annuals. And these are our annuals that I don't mean to be putting in containers. These are the annuals that we could put right out into our garden beds. They're very, very xeric uh, and they're beautiful. Um, some of the xeric annuals that I have here are their arctic seed or some, uh, coreopsis, very long blooming annual. Cosmos, yes, very xeric. They can just pop up wherever they want to. How many have had that problem? Planted some Cosmos and now they're just everywhere. And you're walking through the Valley of Cosmos. Very xeric, very easy to grow, but very beautiful, very beautiful annual. And then the California poppies, those vibrant oranges and those, the beautiful fine texture of its foliage. Globe amaranth is also adds a lot of interest to your annuals. You see these also in uh, containers. And then we also have the annual mallow, which has like a hibiscus type looking leaf, very, very uh, dainty. And then the old favorite, moss rock, or moss rose. Um, and moss rose comes in a variety of colors and is a great ground cover. Now, when you're planting your garden beds, and again, when we're using plants, we wanna think about hydrosomes. So if you have a bed that's typically kind of maybe in the medium range of plants in your, uh, and your drip irrigation is set, when you're doing your annuals, you'll want to group them together. Don't sporadically put them out in the bed. Kind of group them together, have a place for them. In that place, you can till up and amend the soil and, and place in your xeric annuals. And then on your drip irrigation system, you know, place two pop-up little heads there so you have proper irrigation for your xeric annuals. Because even though plants are xeric, in our very, very hot, hot summer days, um, all of our plants need a little bit of supplemental irrigation. And let's talk a little bit more about the lawn. You know, using turf 
in your Xeriscape theme. You know, with your lawn, what you want to think about is the uses and the expectations of the lawn. So as I was mentioning earlier, there are practical places for a lawn and there are impractical places for lawn, that we, where we should not put lawn. So practical places would be where you want your children to play. They want to play ball or maybe where you want to play volleyball. Um, turf also anchors soil and, and uh, so you, it also prevents erosion. And then it also brings an aesthetic value in completing your landscape design. It brings all the elements of your trees and your shrubs and your ground covers and your patios. It brings everything all together. It's kind of the glue uh, of your design. Non-practical areas, again, would be slopes and narrow strips. Narrow strips are t of turf, uh, you just bet that you're going to waste water because there's no way to get a sprinkler head to water that tiny piece of turf and you're going to be watering the concrete sidewalks or garden beds that don't need the uh, extra moisture. Shady areas. Shady areas, you know, um, they're very hard to grow grass in. You know, like I mentioned, fine fescues do well. Um, but in shady areas, if you do have them and you're retrofitting your yard, you might want to think about removing the turf in that area and creating a nice garden bed instead and then incorporating some xeric plants. Um, heavy foot traffic is another place you don't want to have turf, you know. Um, my dogs had a tendency to run in the same place in that piece of that turf area. It's just, it just wore it down. And then my niece and nephew like to run in the same place. And then the kids across the street like to come through my yard over to the common area. And they, so I have this area where the turf is just never going to look good because I got high traffic. So it's a beautiful place for me to convert that to a path or a walkway. Um, with turf grass, it is still my personal opinion and professional opinion that Kentucky bluegrass gets a bad rap. I still favor Kentucky bluegrass for certain reasons and certain functions. For play, for example, for children playing, um, Kentucky bluegrass tolerates high traffic. And so when you're, and you know, and you should be placing your turf areas where they are functional, not so much aesthetically pretty, but functional, places where you're going to be using the turf. Also, Kentucky bluegrass goes dormant, so it goes to sleep in our hot, hot, dry, spells and then comes back to life and is born again with a little bit of water. There are other turf types like blue grama grass and buffalo grass. Now blue grama has a shorter season so get your expectation right. It's not going to be the first thing to green up and it's, it's not going to be the last thing to stay green in the landscape and be careful because it does not tolerate uh, foot traffic very well. Buffalo grass does a little bit better um, but over time, if you've got excess foot traffic, it's going to thin out. So again, thinking about how you're going to use that area of turf, what kind of turf should you be using, set the expectation, and regardless of what you do, as long as you take all those things into consideration, you will be conserving water. Let's talk a little bit about irrigation design with the lawn and how we can conserve water, because so we are going to have turf in our in our yard and we are going to have a play area. So in design I always avoid 90 degree angles with turf. When you're shaping your turf and edging your turf out I always avoid 90 degree angles. Uh, the reason being is that they're very hard to water. If you put a sprinkler head there and you've got a sidewalk here and a bed here and this is your angle then you're obviously going to be wasting water and doing some overspray. Another thing about 90 degree angles, and as I've gotten older, I really am a maintenance uh, conscious person. Um, 90 degree angles typically don't mow well, depending on the application. So with 90 degree angles, you are breaking out the edger and the trimmer and oh my, my, my. Whereas with a curvilinear approach where you keep the curves going, you're pulling out your mower and you're either riding around or walking around and, -da -da -da, and you put it away and, and all is happy and you're back to your barbecue. Um, when you plan for your irrigation, if you're doing your design yourself, for your turf areas, keep in mind always water from the outside in, not the inside out. 
So for example, here you see I have a sidewalk in the street and all my sprinkler heads, my pop-up sprays, are along the sidewalk pushing the water into the turf area. If you start on the inside, then eventually you're going to find some brown spots. You might not get good head-to-head -head coverage and you're going to end up watering the sidewalk. Um, sprinkler heads these days come with various arcs and that's kind of fun because you can do some things um, when you have even a curvilinear design, the way you place your sprinkler heads, you want to make sure that you have head-to-head -head coverage um, for your turf areas. And they come with different types of arts. There's full circles, half circles, quarter circles. And then there's some where you can actually kind of custom the little arc just to get a piece of grass. So take into consideration 90 degree angles, the de outline design of your turf area, and uh, using your efficient sprinkler heads. Mulch in the landscape, we talked a little bit about that. The benefits of mulch in the landscape, oh, it's time for a break. Let me finish this one? Okay, I can finish this one and then we're gonna take a break. Um, mulch in the landscape, very, very important. Um, mulch reduces evaporation, surface evaporation, uh, keeps the soil un underneath the mulch cool, and damp, conserving water. Um, mulch also uh, protects plants in the wintertime, protects the, the roots of the plants from freezing. Um, and my favorite reason for using mulch is to reduce weeds. That's my favorite reason. But I do have to point out um, that a lot of people have put down mulch because they want, they want the mulch to make the weeds go away. Well, if you don't, uh, use mulch to a particular depth, you're not going to get that benefit. I've seen people just kind of scatter some wood mulch or some rock, and what will happen is, you know how seeds travel with the little seeds, and as soon as that seed sees some light, boom, you've got a weed. So when using mulch, whether they be organic or inorganic, rock or wood chips, make sure that it's to a proper depth. For rock, for example, you want a minimum depth of two inches. And then for your, your wood mulch, a minimum depth of three inches. Okay, so you're, what you're trying to do is shade out the area so the weed can't, the sea can't see the light and germinate. Oh, we were talking about mulch in the xeriscape. And again, the organic mulch and inorganic mulch. Now, or, organic mulch such as wood chips, chunk bark, shredded cedar, those types of things, they can break down to, into the soil and add nutrients. So as it decomposes, it breaks down and adds nutrients and improves the soil. The thing with uh, mulch, wood mulch, is that you have to renew it periodically because it is decomposing, it is going away, and sometimes the wind blows it away, and so it does require the maintenance of renewal of it. And you have to be careful too. Um, sometimes wood mulch, it does, uh, as it decomposes, um, it does create a nitrogen deficiency in the soil. And so you might see your plants start struggling. And so what you'll need to do is you'll need to supplement the area with fertilizer. One thing you don't want to do, and I see this, and it's crazy. Every two, um, uh, I have a neighbor, and every year we go out and we get new mulch but we don't get rid of the old mulch and the mulch just keeps piling and piling until all the plants are dead because uh, it's, just a, it's just a bad thing. So replace the mulch, don't get it too deep, three inches, watch your plants. If you're getting, uh, never, never, never till in the wood mulch with your soil when you're com adding your compost and your manure. Never, 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 never do that. Okay, as long as we have understanding there, we can go on. Okay, inorganic mulch. Inorganic mulch basically is rock, oh, excuse me, or stone-based mulch. Uh, things such as uh, local river rock. Um, is, this, is this, am I having a problem? Uh, I think I lost a little fuzzy thing. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience here. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Lava rock, crushed rock, those are stone-based or 
inorganic mulch. Now they last longer, right? Because they don't blow away that easy. They last longer. They're pretty much there for put. Um, it does kind of provide a more formal look to your landscape because things are a little bit more manicure set in place. Um, but be careful, rock does store and radiate heat. So if you have exposed rock that gets the afternoon sun and it's up next to your house, guess what? You're heating up your house. Um, so we're not talking about conserving energy today, but a uh, side note, okay. Um, so watch out when placing rock up against the home. Um, it does get really hot. A lot of times what I like to do in gardening approach is to use the wood mulch around the home and then out in the exposed area, use the rock mulch. And it does make a good combination. Using You don't have to use one, just rock or just wood mulch. You can use both and they both complement each other very, very well. Um, another thing, and this is just a side note, it, as a designer, I'm a very, I guess, a picky designer as for when it comes to aesthetics. Um, but uh, if you have a home and you have beautiful stone on your home, you know, gorgeous stone that you, you maybe spent a lot of money to face your home with, be really, really careful with having rock mulch up around your home because it really does distract from that stone. So. Just, you know, just a side note. Um, weed barrier, not plastic, but weed barrier. If you need to use weed barrier, which I do, I use it under my rock, um, make sure it's permeable, don't use plastic, make sure that it's porous and the water can go through there. Um, and you can pick up this uh, weed barrier fabric at your local nursery. You can also get it from like Home Depot and those types of places. Um, so let's go back to some of the reasons why we thought we wanted to zero escape. Uh, one of the reasons I want to zero escape is because I don't have to water. Well, by now we kind of know that that's not true. <laughs> um, Xeric flowers or Xeric plants, they're rated by their water needs, you know, and a lot of times when you go to nurseries, you'll see their rating, you know, sometimes it says L for low water, M for medium, so make sure you're grouping those appropriately. And then also garden centers, um, around Colorado have come up with the X-rated <laughs> gardening approach um, where one X it requires about an inch of water, uh, plant with a label with three X's, a half an inch of water. So we have the X-rated rating system and actually um, there are X-rated brochures back there. Oh, that just doesn't sound right. There are <laughs> um, for your reading pleasure. Okay, next slide. Uh, water needs for establishing and maintaining xeric plants. Okay, get remember this. Xeric plants um, are not drought tolerant until they're established. Okay, you don't go buy a xeric plant and then just stick it there and, and say good luck with that. Okay, you do have to water your plants to get them established. Um, some people, you know, it's a, it's a matter of time and, and every environment's different, but usually the first couple of seasons we're actually watering regularly. And then as the plant matures and things like that, then you can cut back on the watering for that plant. Also, when we're in very, very dry and drought type uh, summer days, uh, plants do need supplemental watering, okay? Um, but more commonly, they die because we overwater them. Darn it. So, but please do remember plants, all xeric plants, even xeric plants, need water. Um, okay, so the other myth was I don't have to amend the soil, true or false. And most of the time that's false. Um, basically, 80% of our problems with plants not being healthy is due to the soil. It starts with the soil. The soil is very important. It provides the nutrients that the plant needs to be healthy. Uh, good soil also allows oxygen to move and water to move and nutrients to move. Um, so soil is very, very important. Um, in new construction, you'll have some very compacted areas where people have driven on them, machines have set there. And so uh, that soil, can you imagine, you put water on it, it's just gonna just sit there and then suck down and then no oxygen, it's just ucky ucky. And actually some of us have that in our yard even if it, we don't have trucks sitting on it. It's just yucky yucky stuff. So 
soil amendment is very, very important. Now, based on the type of plant, okay, there are some native plants that we have uh, that do not want soil amendment. They do not want additional nutrients. Actually, they'll burn up by too many nutrients. So when you're researching your plants and you're buying them at your local nursery or you're doing your studying uh, on the website or whatever, when you uh, fall in love with the plant, make sure you read up on it. If it is a native plant, understand its fertilizing requirements, its soil amendment, its nutrient requirements, because you don't want to overlove a plant to death either. Um, soil myth amendment for existing landscapes. This can be a kind of a tough one. And again, this is my kind of my area of expertise is retrofitting uh, landscapes and, and giving uh, yards facelifts. But it might just be darn near impossible to go in there and try to take compost, you know, one to three inches of compost and till it in to a depth of six to eight inches because we might have, you know, a beautiful maple tree or a beautiful honey locust and the root system is out. And if we did that, we'd be destroying the roots of the tree. Um, we might have some existing beds and perennials and shrubs that we are really in love with. And again, we don't want to interfere with the root system of those plants. So there may be times where it is in, impractical to uh, do soil amendments. So if that's the case in, in, in your home, then you might want to consider some alternatives for soil amendment. Um, you might want to select more of our native plants, more, more of those plants that are more adaptive to our icky soils. Um, they're not icky plants, it's just icky soil. Um, you might want to space your plants out further from each other because they're probably not getting a lot of nutrients and, and water. So you don't want to have your plants too close together or they're going to compete for the water and the nutrients. So you might want to space them out just a little bit further. Um, another technique that's very, uh, very popular is maybe taking your beds and raising them. Um, raised beds aren't not necessarily for vegetables alone. They can be for perennials and annuals and things that, like that that you enjoy. Uh, one of the fads that I see <clears throat> coming along is that there's actually vegetables raised gardens going into people's front yards. Soil tests. So what do I know is in my soil? What's happening with my soil? A soil test is a great tool for you and understanding your soil and what's happening with your plants. Um, a soil test basically goes in and analyzes the soil. It can actually even tell you kind of drainage patterns of the water and will tell you what nutrients are readily available in your soil so you know what to do with your plants. Do I need to add soil amendment? Do I need to add fertilizer? Um, well, we'll have, you should do this if it's, a, if it's a new site especially. You have no idea what's in that soil. Um, a soil test would be just totally invaluable at that point. Um, second of all, if you have existing landscape and you're noticing that your plants are starting to do poorly, become unhealthy, have diseases, pests, problems, what's happening? What's happening with my soil? Um, get a soil test. It's not just something you do once. In my opinion, it's something you do regularly, routinely. And you do it when you start to see problems in your landscape. Don't just assume all the time it's just water. I've seen people that have you know, yellow leaves, which could be chlorosis and things like that, that are just watering the heck out of them or have stopped watering them because they have yellow leaves. I mean, how do you know if a plant is dying when it has yellow leaves? Well one of two things. It has too much water or it doesn't have enough. That's pretty much what it is. Um, so, and there are a lot of facilities around here locally that provide soil tests. Colorado State University is a great resource for you, but soil tests are very important. It's, it's, it's nice to know what's in there and what you need to do to have healthy plants. Healthy plants conserve water. Pruning. I don't have to prune because I have native plants and they're just going to grow and be natural and look beautiful all the time. Ooh, no, 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 no. No. Pruning is uh, an ongoing maintenance um, uh, thing that you have to do with your plants. Unpruned shrubs that have just been left to just do their own thing 
um, basically then stop developing new buds. It's like, well, you know what? You know, my lilac used to be full of blooms or my forsythia used to be really full of blooms and every year I notice, you know, it's not blooming as much. Well, if it hasn't been pruned properly, um, there could be some problems uh, because the, the plant can no longer support the flower bud development. Um, there is techniques to proper pruning and shaping. Proper pruning is not getting out the electric shears and going meow. That is not proper pruning whatsoever. Um, and there's proper shaping of shrubs. Now you can what I call poodle a shrub. You know, if you have a Japanese style garden, for example, and you're, I call it poodling, you're making you know, Edward Scissor hand, you're making little Mickey Mouses and what have you. Um, but proper pruning is still important even when you're doing that type of shaping. Proper pruning involves going in and removing one third of the oldest growth of that shrub, which in layman's terms is the oldest canes. Okay, the oldest canes, the big canes. And what that's gonna do is when you remove them, you're gonna remove them all the way down to the ground. It's gonna open up that shrub, allow the light in, allow oxygen, allow movement. Um, how many have seen shrubs where it can't be dead because it's got all this green on top, keeps sprouting this green, but ugh, it's dead on the inside. That's a lack of, lack of ox oxygen, a lack of light. So with a shrub, you wanna prune it down, remove one third of the oldest growth, take it all the way down, open up that plant, rejuvenate it. Shrubs like to be pruned. Most shrubs in general like to be pruned. I've even heard stories where they didn't know what it was and they just whacked it all the way down and guess what, now it's like four feet tall and this is the most beautiful plum they ever saw, you know. So shrubs like to be pruned. It's good. It's healthy. Also, by pruning and opening up spaces, uh, your shrubs are more, uh, are less susceptible to diseases and, and pests, you know, because anything, you know, pests, they like to go in places that are crowded and things like that. So proper pruning. Um, if you're retrofitting your yard, Okay, and you keep shearing this shrub because it's in the walkway. Or you keep shearing this tree be because every time you're mowing, it's whacking you in the face. Okay, you probably want to consider replacing that plant with something that at its full and expected mature growth is going to fit the space. Because that hacking and whacking and schwacking is not real healthy on you or the plant. Um, so again, proper pruning will increase the health of the plant. Make sure you do your research on your pruning though. You can't just prune whatever you want to. Um, you know, you have your spring flowering shrubs, your summer flowering shrubs, and if you prune at the improper time, you're actually pruning off the new buds. So research your plants, understand when it blooms. Most of the time after a shrub blooms is when you, you um, actually kind of whack it. And I'm not afraid to say the word whack. I like whacking. I'm a, I'm a whacking kind of gal. Uh, plant life expectancy. So I have all xeric plants, so they're, they're never going to die. They're going to just live forever. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, just like with anything else, with house plants or what have you. You know, xeric plants can die. There's not enough water. There's too much water. There's not enough nutrients. There's too much nutrients. The plant itself is naturally short-lived. Again, a little bit of research here. Not all plants live forever. There are some plants that live for a long time, such as your bristlecone pine. And then there are other plants that may give up after three to four years. Lilacs don't last forever. We try to hang on to them. They're full of bore. They look gray. They're, oh, they don't live forever. So they, does, no plants live forever. Um, also, if the plant is planted in the wrong microclimate, and what I mean by microclimate is, you know, it's in the sun, shade, water, all the things in this climate that affect the plant. So if I put a sunny plant into a shade area, then obviously we're going to have some issues there. And also, if your plants aren't healthy, diseases and pests, and we're not controlling the situation, your plants will die. Ooh. Understanding growth rate. 
Um, some plants grow faster than others. And you need to consider that, especially when using plants uh, for functional reasons. Some plants, such as the bristlecone pine, although it's the oldest living plant, it also grows incredibly slow, really, really slow. So let's say you have a new home and you want screening and privacy, or you're retrofitting your landscape and you want to hide the neighbor's trampoline. So you want a hedge, and whether it be deciduous or evergreen. Um, it's great. So you go to Home Depot and you buy that little plant that's about that big and it takes forever for it to grow. So that's not giving you the functional reason. So I may not want to go with like a spruce or evergreens. I may want to go to them junipers and they can be pretty. Don't, they're not so bad, but junipers grow pretty rapidly and I could get that screening and hedging. So if you're placing plants for functional reasons because you want their maturity to perform something aesthetically or functional for you, make sure you understand the growth rate of that plant especially. Um, Overplanting, oh my gosh, overplanting. Um, boy, I see this a lot um, where we just don't have the patience. And so we go and we buy the big beautiful shrub and then we put it in the yard and then it swallows up the house, you know. Um, overgrown plants aren't healthy either. You know, they're crowding, they're fighting each other, they're competing with each other. Some people say, well, I'm not gonna worry about it because shoot, I'll be gone by, <laughs> by the time that plant's going to be overgrown. Just remember that your yard also is an investment. You know, whether you're going to stay in your home forever, or you're going to resell your, your yard, uh, your, your uh, landscape is an important investment. And if you're going to resell your home, you don't want people coming up and going, oh, look at that. Oh, I'm going to have to spend days ripping out that and sh taking out that and cleaning up that. So. Um, Overplanting is just, it's just not good practice. It also looks really bad. Watering turf, do I have to water my turf? Oh, I think we're all getting the hang of this, yes. Um, again, I do still enjoy my Kentucky bluegrass or my ryegrass, and it does require about two and a quarter inches of water a week under our extreme high conditions. Tall fescue, um, for some reason, I don't know how it got out there, but a lot of people thought tall fescue was very, very drought tolerant and, and could withstand um, uh, dry spells. But in actuality, it can take just as much water as Kentucky bluegrass. So do your research. Buffalo grass and blue gramma grasses, they can remain green in hot, dry, and, and for a long, dry, dry hot spells. Um, but remember on the flip side, what is that grass serving? Is it for the play area for the children? It might not be the best grass because it doesn't take the traffic. So some things to consider. I don't mean to confuse you. I want to educate you so that you just don't go out and make the wrong decisions. Um, also with shady lawns, you may require less water because of the shade. So it stays a little moister, a little cooler. So you might be conserving water because you have a mature landscape. And I bought all my plants at the local nursery, so they must all be xeric. <laughs> no, they're not. Our local nurseries carry beautiful xeric plants, native plants, and other non-native plants. And why? Well, not all of our areas in our landscape are dry, right? We have areas where it is wet. We have areas where we do want to enjoy some other plants. And again, as long as you keep your hydrozone practice, you'll still be conserving water. Um, when you go to a local nursery, if you are interested in the xeric plant specifically, ask them to show you what they have available. A lot of times they have them grouped together in a certain area or they have our plant select plants in a certain area. So ask your lo local nursery and just remember your hydrozoning. There are a lot of resources available to you. Oh my gosh, with the internet now. You know, you just can get overwhelmed. But here I've listed for you some very, very good uh, resources and some websites with the city of Fort Collins being one of the best and Colorado Wise and Green Co. And 
the Colorado State University Extension Office. If you're new to this area, the Colorado State University Extension Office just offers a plethora of information and they also offer fact sheets that basically outline or, or focus on a specific area or issue that you might be having in your landscape. So they're, they're really, really good. Plant Select is a wonderful organization along with Plant Talk. Um, if you're a face-to-face -face kind of person like I am, go to your local nurseries, look at the plants, talk to your, your, the people at the nursery, ha have them to help you. Um, and then, you know, there are people like me, your local landscape designers, who we encourage uh, the practice of Xeriscape and we love to work with people in retrofitting or designing their, their Xeriscapes. And I'm, so I'm going to finish probably a little bit early, which I don't think is a bit bad thing, but in summary, Xeriscape is a water conscious and a creative landscape approach. Um, whether it's new, whether it's uh, existing, xeric plants and xeriscaping can fit the functionality and offer you the aesthetics that you need so that it's a place that you can go out and enjoy. With this incredible weather that we have in Colorado, and I mean all year round, there's no reason why we can't be out there enjoying our outdoor space. Um, remember that you're not stuck to a desert looking landscape you know with Zurich plants and the proper placement uh, and arrangement you can have Japanese gardens English gardens formal gardens herb herb gardens and herbs gardens and and Bob's gardens you know so you you're not you're not stuck to a desert looking yard um, Better than that, if you're getting ready and you're, you're di diving more into this as you're, you're doing your planning, there's nothing like seeing Xeriscape live. Livescape is what I call it, livescape. You want to get up and pers close and personal and touch it and smell it and all that crazy stuff. Well, we have some beautiful Xeric demonstration, uh, demonstration gardens around the state of Colorado and in Fort Collins, Trinidad, Sterling, Grand Junction. Um, um, I've also listed for you here the Denver Water Conservation Hotline, and if you call that number, they'll be able to give you referrals to places with demonstration gardens, and they also have some brochures available. Um, I think we have uh, most of the brochures here this evening. Um, okay. I have really enjoyed spending time with you this evening and being able to share with you uh, the approach of Xeriscaping. I hope that I have been helpful um, to you in answering some questions or and busting some myths about Xeriscape. And what I'd like to do right now is to open it, uh, open up the, the session to any questions and or if you have any answers you'd like to share with me, I, I would love to have those too. So thank you. Thank you for your time this evening and I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Yes? Um, mm -hmm. it, it depends on how long you want to wait. You know, um, there are approaches where you can actually cover your grass with plastic and things like that and, and let it die. If you're in a little bit more of a hurry and if you're doing it yourself, um, there are um, of these machines and they're really fun to use. I, I like equipment, <laughs> um, but they're <laughs> turf removers and they're very easy to use and you can rent them for a few dollars a day and basically you can take your turf and it cuts it up and, and rolls it out and so you could use one of those or you could put plastic on it, kill it, you know, and then the first thing you want to do after that is design your irrigation system for your new turf layout if you're going to replace the turf or redesign the turf or um, address your irrigation system for your new planting bed. So do you, do you get rid of that grass or can you turn it into you know, the soil and use it? You can, well, if you, if you are in a hurry, you probably want to take it off site or use it somewhere else in the landscape. Um, if you have the time, you can let it die and till it in, but make sure it's really, really, really dead because um, that's another thing that, that happens is we have these beautiful landscapes and, and we have this edging. And people are always saying, well, I have edging, but the grass gets into my bed. How can that be? 
And this, it, this does help answer your question. And that is because most of our grass, and especially if you have Kentucky bluegrass, grows through rhizomes, right? So it grows under, okay? And when we say soil amendment, we also do soil amendment for new construction for turf areas. Because you can't throw sod on that, that compacted clay and expect it to live. So we have to go in and amend the soil. And we like to go in and amend the soil to about six to eight inches. Eight inches preferably. The reason being is because grass roots grow about six to eight inches, okay? Um, so in order for the lawn to be healthy, we have to amend the soil. Now, the reason that the grass gets into your beds is because, guess what? It's not going over the top. It's going under. And when we put that edger in, boy, we just get into this real bad, bad circle of events. Um, we put edger in to prevent, you know, mulch and things and, and grass from moving into our beds. But unless we can have an edger that was eight inch, right? We, we're gonna have to pull some grass out of our beds. The other thing about having an eight inch edger is how in the world do you get that in the clay soil? You know, yeah, you're gonna, uh. So we have an ongoing battle. No, there is no magical cure for creeping grass out of your beds. I did hear of a, a product, but I, I think they pulled it from the market. I haven't used it myself, called Over the Top, which is supposed to keep grass. Has anybody used that over the top to try to keep grass out of their garden beds? I think, I don't know if it's even on the market anymore. So um, that's why I say make sure the grass is really, really dead. Okay, you're welcome. Any more questions? Well, if you can get your pet to go in one place to do their business, that's awesome. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's really, really awesome. You know, that 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 is something um, I do pet friendly designs. And it usually depends on the dog, how the dog's been trained. Some dogs have been trained to go on gravel. Some have been trained to go on grass. Some have been trained actually to go on the mulch. Um, so in your particular case, you have a pet and it, is it used to going in a particular place or liking particular material? All over. All over? Um, that's more of a training issue, unfortunately. Um, none of the landscape elements that I know of are gonna attract the dog to go in one place. Um, I will tell you some things that you can do in high traffic areas where they like to maybe jump up to the fence and see people, they typically don't potty there, right? They, they typically kind of stay, so if they've got something to do over there, um, it's some place where they like to play and things like that, they typically don't go over on that side. But I, I don't know outside of training, and they do have, um, I saw it the other day, It's a. it looks like a piece of, grass uh, and it's a, a potty pad and you can start if you get a pet like in the winter time and you're trying to train it you can train it to go on this potty pad <laughs> good luck uh, the dog whisperer um, and then take that pad outside and place it where you want the dog to go potty and so that might be that might be helpful uh, you know, what you have to be careful of with your manure, I mean, if you're using straight manure or if you're actually mixing it with organic, um, is, you know, there's nitrogen levels at, in there and can, can facilitate some burning. Um, so using manure, you have to be really, really careful. Um, I've it's even... Aged. It's aged. Mm -hmm. um, you just want to be real careful. And, you know, if you, what you could do, what I would suggest is um, putting on top or even um, mixing it in with a, a different type of compost uh, matter just to kind of balance it out. Manures can be really, really strong. I've seen them apply to the lawn and just, you know, burn it up. So, yes? The bindweed, you know, that is something that we do not have uh, something to take care of. Um, bindweed uh, is just a daily sore for us. Um, you know, if, if you um, pull it in the spring, you know, 
what will happen is you might get some of it, but then when you pull something like that, it has a tendency to pop up in other places. So if you can be patient, there are some stronger weed killers, and I really don't like using chemicals, but if you have a place where it's just very invasive and, and ruining your property, there are some uh, stronger weed killers that you can purchase, and you have to be patient, and you have to apply them to the bindweed, but don't pull it. You have to let it go all the way down into the roots, all the way down into the system, and kill the entire plant, which is gonna work good and then maybe you'll have a nice place, you know, it'll be gone for, for that year, but next year, the year after, I'm sorry, it's, it's gonna come back. I'm, I, I, I hate to say that, but uh, there, uh, there is no magic formula, I'm sorry. Yes? Potentia that is overgrown, when to prune and spray, please. Okay, with your potentia, it is a summer blooming shrub. So basically the best time to prune it, it would be in the fall after it blooms, okay? Um, because it's gonna set its buds for the next summer. And I'll remember, especially what Polenteas and Spireas, you know, they get really woody inside. Make sure you do that pruning technique. Go in there, get, get that old wood out of there, and you know, get some light, some oxygen, some water in there, you know. Yes. This spring, not, not unless you don't want to see the pretty flowers on the potent tea. Okay. okay. Patience. 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 That's what gardening taught me, patience. There are other dwarf conifers, not labeled so much as xeric as, as these are, but there are beautiful dwarf conifers, such as our uh, spruces. There are some dwarf spruces, St. Mary's broom, um, Mesa Verde spruce, uh, globe spruces. Um, they're not as xeric as uh, the pines. Um, they're a little bit cleaner because pines will shed. Uh, the spruces don't shed. Um, you have to be careful with spruces not to put them in an area of, of uh, poorly drained soil where it stays really wet. They, they don't like their feet wet. So if you're trying to put it in a place where it, it might be wet, you might want to mound it up a little bit. Um, but we do have dwarf varieties. And spruces in general, they're not classified so much as a xeric plant, but in many cases, it is a, a, a plant for our climate. Uh, it requires a little bit more uh, water than maybe a pine to get established. Uh, but again, by grouping that plant with other plants of the similar water needs, you're still conserving water. Oh, and the watering conditions there? Is it real wet? Is it moderate water? Um, does it? Um, they, they, they're really susceptible to, to drowning. Um, and also, there's another reason, and it's hard to say. You know, there's so many reasons why, why things happen, but um, do you winter water? you do winter water. So that's very, very good. Um, uh, a lot of our dwarf conifers, um, they need water in the winter, especially when we don't get any precipitation. Um, evergreens, if you think about them, they don't stop growing, right? They keep going, that's why they're evergreen. We're deciduous, you know, they drop their leaves and they go a little bit dormant. Um, for, are you fertilizing? No. Good, you don't fertilize those, so that's not it. So, um, I'm not quite sure. I'm a, My house is white. I think facing the west it just gets too much. Too much sun? To, it's too, um, you might want to increase the water if it's getting too much sun. They, they do like it sunny and dry. They really do. They really are pretty intolerant to, to shade, and they are more healthy in our direct sun. So um, you could do the screwdriver test, you know, and see down if, you know, the screwdriver test just, just to let you know, you know, <laughs> is it too wet, is it too dry? Um, I don't know. Uh, you, but you do know that if you stick your finger on the top of the soil, that's going to give you an incorrect reading, right? Because we have wind and that's going to dry out. So is there really enough water? If it's dry on the top and you water, you could be drowning your plants. So what I typically do is I use a screwdriver and I take that screwdriver near the drip line or if it's a new plant near the root ball and I stick that screwdriver into the ground. If it goes in easily, then the, the, it is moist. There is water down there. Um, if it goes in 
a little easy and then gets really hard, then I know that the water that I need to more deep water um, that area because the water's not going down. And in Colorado, it is better to do deep watering than in frequent water because in frequent water, because it's being so hot and dry here, you lose a lot of that through evaporation. So you want to make sure that the water is, is getting down into the roots. Hopefully that's helpful. A little. Okay. I, um, sometimes I've seen with, uh, if you're losing your dwarf uh, spruces, your dwarf conifers, um, they can be a, a kind of a tricky plant. If you keep planting them in the same place, they keep dying. So there's something in that area. And so a soil test, if I, was, if I had lost a dwarf conifer, because they're fairly expensive, um, I would actually probably take my first tool out of my pocket and go get a soil test.